Good afternoon and welcome to the Akron Roundtable. I'm Angelina Milo, board chair and president of the Akron Roundtable Board of Directors. Today's program will be rebroadcast on Thursday, June 24th at 8 p.m. on WKSU 89.7 FM. We're delighted that so many of you are able to join us today for this virtual forum, as it's truly a pleasure to welcome to the Roundtable stage, Rachel Cargill, public academic writer and philanthropic innovator. Her topic is literature as a gateway to understanding. We sincerely thank the Akron Summit County Public Library for continuing to host our virtual events. We're also thankful for the generous support Akron Roundtable receives from its sponsors, patrons, and subscribers. Today's program is generously sponsored by the Akron Community Foundation. And now for a brief message on our annual campaign, I'd like to introduce fellow Akron Roundtable board member and development chair, Ryan Pendleton. Ryan. Good afternoon. Thank you, Angelina. This past year has challenged us in so many ways. Despite it all, we've still found new ways to connect while creating an engaging forum for our dynamic speakers. We hope you've enjoyed participating in our live virtual forums and have been listening to our podcast series of most memorable and signature roundtable events. However, the best is yet to come later this summer when we can once again meet in person. We can't wait to see you, our friends, network with our peers and celebrate being back together with you at Roundtable. We accomplish all of this and more with a very small operating budget a part-time staff of two, strong support from our 33 board members, and the support of many of the businesses in our community. I am asking you today to help us continue to bring the world to Akron by making a gift to our annual campaign. Please know that every dollar donated is critical for us to continue to bring these incredible speakers to you. Many of you have already received our mailing. If you have responded, thank you so much. If you've not made a gift yet, please mail in your donation card or visit our website at akronroundtable.org forward slash support. Your gift will directly impact our mission to inspire and create community connections. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. I'd like to take a moment to thank Ryan again as well as all of our board members and our staff for their hard work. I'm very fortunate to serve alongside such an outstanding group of community leaders dedicated. My apologies. I am very fortunate to serve alongside such an outstanding group of community leaders dedicated to the Akron Roundtable mission. Please visit our website for a list of our board members and staff. Again, as Ryan mentioned, our website is akronroundtable.org. Please mark your calendars now for our next event, Thursday, July 15th, when we will host Regina Cooper Benjamin, Deputy Director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. You may read more about our upcoming speakers by going to our website. Also on our podcast page of our website, you may listen to Akron Roundtable programs. We're grateful to the University of Akron and its Excel Center for Experiential Learning for sponsoring our podcast series. Today's speaker, Rachel Cargill, will be introduced by fellow Akron Roundtable board member, Teresa Legrere, president and CEO of the Akron Urban League. Following her presentation, Rachel has generously agreed to take questions from our audience. Jennifer Ross, Director of Diversity and Strategic Initiatives at the Akron Urban League will coordinate that portion of the program. To facilitate your questions, we'll be using Asker technology. Asker technology enables you to submit questions via mobile devices. Questions may be submitted at any time during our program and will be forwarded for review during our Q&A portion watch the screen for instructions should you need them. For those of you on social media, 
please follow us at Akron Roundtable on Facebook and on Twitter and use hashtag Akron Roundtable to continue the conversation. And now it is truly my pleasure to introduce to you Teresa Legrere. Good afternoon. I am so pleased to introduce Rachel. I've known Rachel for many years and she is just a dynamic woman. Rachel has established herself as a national leader on many fronts. She is passionate and driven to advocate for women and the wrongs around the issues of race. Rachel is an Akron, Ohio born public academic, writer and philanthropic innovator. Her upcoming book with the Dial Press, Penguin Random House, I Don't Want Your Love and Light examines the intersection of race, feminism, and womanhood, and how we are in relationship with ourselves and one another. Rachel is the founder and president of the Loveland Foundation Incorporated, a nonprofit offering free therapy to Black women and girls. Rachel recently, recently launched The Great Unlearn, a self-paced, self-priced community utilizing Rachel's monthly curated social syllabus. As a gift to her younger self, Rachel created Elizabeth's Bookshop and Writing Center, currently an online independent bookstore and innovative literacy center designed to amplify, celebrate, and honor the work of writers who are often excluded from traditional cultural, social, and academic canons. Rachel has been featured on TEDx and Red Table Talk is a regular contributor to Harper's Bazaar and has been featured in the Washington Post, Glamour Magazine UK, Essence Magazine, Refinery29, Forbes, and the New Yorker Magazine. So again, as you can see, Rachel has established herself on a national stage and we are so excited that we actually get to hear her story today right here in her hometown, Akron, Ohio. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you Ms. Rachel Cargill. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. It's so special to have the opportunity to be introduced by you. It's very, very special to be able to be in conversation with my hometown, Akron Roundtable. Thank you so much for inviting me here to um, just be part of this com community again and in a very different um, and beautiful way and to just have the chance to reconnect with such a special part of my existence and conversation with you all in Akron. Um, thank you for being here and for being willing to be in conversation, particularly about literature, something I'm very passionate about. I am a very, I hope this is more of a conversation. So if you are here in the chat, I'd love to hear what parts of Northeast Ohio you're from, what part of Akron, maybe what Akron High School you graduated from. I graduated from Hoban um, in 07. <laughs> Uh, so if you're here and you're able to leave something in the chat, I'd love to hear from you. But I will spend just a few moments introducing myself. So I grew up in green. In Green, actually, I went to Green. I went to Chapel Hill Christian School uh, growing up, and then I went to Green Middle School, and I ended up graduating from Hoban. And my experience in Akron was so definitive in a lot of ways, not only because of the environment and the location, but particularly because of literature. And so, upon returning back to Akron, I opened up a bookstore, and it's called Elizabeth's Bookshop and Writing Center. It's currently located within um, the Well Compass Coffee. And we have been really enjoying, my team and I, the opportunity to dig into new conversation with this place that I used to be so familiar with before um, I moved away and I ended up being, I lived in Washington, D.C. for a few years, and now I have a home here in Brooklyn, New York, as well as uh, back in Akron. <laughs> So, oh, I see a lot of Hoban people here. This makes me so happy to see you. Um, so my decision to come back to Akron was one largely based in family, wanting to be closer to my aging mother, wanting to be more in conversation with family members in ways that I wasn't able to being in bigger cities and particularly being so far over on the East Coast. But when I came back, I recognized that the thing that I found so much richness in, in my childhood experience in Akron was books, 
the books, the bookstores that I went to, but particularly the main library downtown. And at the time that I came back, there weren't a ton of bookstores that I was able to dig into in the ways that I was in the bigger cities that I was living in, particularly a black owned bookstore. And I missed that. There was something about the shelves being full of people who I felt I had a literary ancestry with, that the shelves were being reflecting were, were reflecting for me a lot of the thought the thoughts and the theory and the understanding of people of color who I take so much lead from. And so I decided that if I was going to get that there in Akron, I would have to create it myself. And so I created Elizabeth's Bookshop. Elizabeth is my middle name. And um, a funny story of when I was younger, I used to always beg my mom to call me Elizabeth. I used to say, tell the teachers that's my name. Tell them that my name isn't really Rachel. And the silly things that we do when we're younger. And so Elizabeth, uh, me naming it Elizabeth, was a gift to my younger self to say here now you have something called Elizabeth and um, it's in reference to your absolute favorite thing which is literature and reading and diving into these worlds and so this conversation literature as a gateway to understanding is really rooted so much in um, my own growth through literature, my own understanding of myself through literature specifically the literature that I was approaching um, that I was engaging with in my hometown of Akron, Ohio, which is very um, important for a few reasons I'm going to get to in a moment. Uh, someone said, thanks for shouting out the main library. Yes, the main library. Do you guys remember, I'm sure you remember, when the elephant sculpture used to be right there in the library, and I have so many memories of um, playing on and around, which was probably absolutely against the rules. Um, <laughs> that Oh, it's still there. That makes me so happy. Um, <laughs> so I am so, so I have, I have many visceral memories with literature with um, childhood and with understanding myself all through the lens of books. And I think you all might also, I think that there's a lot of, um, a lot of relation that we have to literature that we might not even be aware of. So I'm excited to talk a little bit more about it today. And I don't have a ton of time, so I'm going to dive in to some of the things that I wanted to discuss. And the first is that, you know, Ryan, during your, um, conversation that you were having about people being able to contribute. I think that there is, you, you said the language bring the world to Akron. And I think there's so much beauty in the realities that we have so much access via technology to bring different voices and understandings to the world right there in Akron. But one way that that shows up is in literature in being able to offer particularly our children, but also ourselves voices and perspectives that we would never have the opportunity to. And this is being done in a speaker's setting, but we can't neglect the reality that so much of what we understand about the world is through the portals of books and literature. And these are the things that are assigned to us in classes. This is the literature that is sitting on our bookshelves that parents, you know, parents are always saying, how can I get my kids to read more diverse books? Do you have diverse books on your bookshelf at home? Do you have things that they can easily go and pick out and flip through to have a different understanding of how others exist in the world? Um, and the literature, um, even even small things, literature that we read, and I'm going to call this literature, all of this is materials that we read, billboards, what we're seeing, what is presented to us, the language that is used to give us a community identity. And I think that, um, sorry, I think that we dismiss the worlds that are sitting there on our shelves. We dismiss the voices that we often could hear from and have an understanding of because we often get so rooted in um, only listening, you know, especially within social media, feeling like only those with the largest platforms have the most to say or the most necessary things to say. And we need to take a step back and say, how are we consuming things? How are we recognizing ourselves in other ways besides simply being reflected with, by the people around us? I wanted to share a story about uh, when I was younger and I was attending a school, I was attending Green. I was at Green for middle school and my mom had handed me, my mom and I uh, had a very 
developed maybe a relationship with literature between ourselves to where when she would finish a book, she would just hand it off to me. I learned to read pretty early. And I think she just trusted my cognitive development to be able to really read stories that might have seemed older for older people. And my mother had handed me um, a Toni Morrison book in middle school. And I remember going to school and my white teacher taking the book from me and being like, I don't remember what she said, but I remember how she made me feel, which is a nod to a quote that my Angela often says, people won't ever really remember what she said, but they'll remember how they made you feel or how you made them feel. And I remember she took the book from me and she said, this is not a book that you should be reading right now. And in my you know, fifth grade head, I was trying to think, well, the words aren't too big. So that's okay. I'm assuming that's okay. And I, I was having pretty good reading comprehension. I was following the story. So that was okay. And I recognized that she thought that she, 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 she took a world away from me. She took an opportunity for me to see myself through a Black writer for me to be critical with the story that was happening. And she took away a Black voice that I rarely had access to, you know, going to a school in green and the stories that we were reading weren't centered in that. And how that moment of her physically taking the book out of my hands shut a door. It shut a door to how I was able to continue to explore. And in other ways, now as an adult, I think I wish she would have asked me what I was learning from it or tried to get more of a gauge on how her feelings might not actually be a reality for me. And so that relationship with literature, knowing that when someone took a book away from me, that meant that they were closing a door based on their own perception of what it should be. And that really, um, that really jolted something in me at a young age that I would never let anyone manage my consumption of knowledge, my consumption of literature, my consumption of words for other people, specifically the people that I wanted to hear from, who at that time and my whole life long, Toni Morrison was absolutely in, in that space. And I want to encourage all of us to consider our relationship to literature and our relationship to understanding and the intersection of those two. So I attended a I attended uh, Columbia, yes, exactly why public libraries are so incredibly important. Um, I attended Columbia University for a little while before I decided to pursue my academia uh, independently and publicly. But while I was there, I was, was taking a class and we had such a beautiful conversation and I wanted to bring this to, I wanted to bring it to this uh, audience and to this community. I'll call it a community actually, since we're all part of this space, particularly of Akron, of you know, when we're looking at literature, when we're deciding what's on our to read list, and when I say literature, I'm not just saying it in the grand academic way. I'm saying it like, what's on your bookshelf? What's on your bookshelf at home? What are you reading? What's on your bed table? Um, what you're deciding to look into. When we're looking at literature, I want you to consider a few things. The first is the realities of how literature and how canons, that's a word I, that I use often too, canons. These, and if you're not familiar, a, a canon is looking at the set of work that is often celebrated and lauded as a groundwork or a framework for any given collection. And when we're thinking about nonfiction, fiction, you can think of the authors and the books that are often always read in high schools, always read in college intro courses, always offered to children, and how we are being in it, I don't want to use the word inundated, but we are being, um, saturated with the language, the perception, the lens of a very small group of people. And oftentimes those people are white, those people are cisgendered, those people are male, those people are neurotypical, those people have never experienced a disability. Often, so we are having a very narrow lens through which we are experiencing the world in the ways we are looking to via books that we read. And one thing that I that was brought up for me that really shifted the way that I approach literature, the world, my work, was this question of who gets to tell their stories, who gets to tell their own stories. And for the situations in which someone is telling the story on behalf of other people, what is the lens through which they're doing it? And it, it looks like the questions, who gets to be known and who are the knowers? Who gets to be the academics or the writers and who usually only gets to exist as subjects? And 
particularly at Columbia, we were talking about how there's no such thing as white studies. There's African-American studies. There's what was very outdatedly called Oriental studies. There is, you know, Native American studies. But why are we constantly being picked apart and our stories being told on our behalf as opposed to us giving the resources, giving the book, being given the book deals, being given the tenure, being given the space to tell our own stories, that there's this added incentive of oftentimes whiteness making the determination for what is told, how it's told, how it's celebrated, and who gets to be centered in, in the story, even in times where it looks like, you know, we're saying that this is a Black initiative, or this is an initiative for the Indigenous community. Oftentimes, it's still told through the lens of the people who have the power in that space. And that's where power shifts and these national conversations trickle down to every single part of our lives, from the books that we're reading, the clothes that we're wearing, <laughs> the communities that we're able to build. And that literature as a gateway to understanding is very clear to all the powers that be. And that's why it's so managed and so controlled. And that's why the canons look the way that they do is because there's this recognition that whatever knowledge is most available, that's what will be consumed and that's what will be acted upon. And so my work through my bookstore and what I hope to bring out in this conversation is that we have to reimagine this landscape of literature, which automatically reevaluates the landscape of understanding how we understand ourselves, how we understand other people, and how we understand that relationship to each other. And it's really a conversation. It's really a reflection um, to to open a book and to read the words of someone who has lived a life that's nothing like yours. And what these and, and what that offers us is an opportunity to have to be more critical and to have more compassion. And I teach from a framework of KEA, which stands for knowledge, empathy, and action. And this came from me having an experience where I was looking to teach on the um, the Kwanzaa holiday. And I was looking for a children's book about Kwanzaa written by a black person, which didn't seem like too much to ask in my opinion. So um, I go, I'm looking, I'm, I'm reaching out to my publishing world contact saying like, hey, can someone get, I'm looking on like Amazon. I'm looking on every, you know, bookshop that every website I could find. And I would look for the book and then I would look for who the author was, which is something I do in a lot of ways that I move through the world of people from the way if you want to donate to my organization I not all I you know all money isn't good money and I want to be in conversation with what does your board look like are you looking to support black people just for the show of it during 2020 and 2021 or are you putting black people into leadership so being critical about how you approach various aspects of life but your literature can also be such a shift in how you engage with work and as I was looking for this book on Kwanzaa I couldn't find any books that were written by Black people. And it really made me start to wonder, what was it? I know that there's a lot of Black writers who would happily write about Kwanzaa. So it had nothing to do with access. It had to do with this gatekeeping of opportunity and this gatekeeping of the stories being told. And, and it really concerned me and it really was a catalyst for how I wanted to build Elizabeth and how I wanted Elizabeth to show up um, in the world, not just as a holding place for lost literature, but as a celebration of all the things that haven't gotten the chance to be as celebrated as they should have been, as centralized as they should have been. And so I'm hoping that that's how, um, that's how Elizabeth shows up in the world. And that's my personal, my personal um, fabric, that my personal material that I'm offering to this fabric of our collective understanding, of our collective growth and approach to, to literature. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up in the importance of literature is understanding, particularly the importance of 
our understanding of ourselves. Um, as a young Black girl growing up in a predominantly white space, I didn't have many reflections of people who looked like me, people who thought like me, or people who were going through the same experiences that I was, whether it was code switching, um, me figuring out ways to engage respectably with the white community while also maintaining these aspects of my Blackness that um, often wasn't respected or appreciated in white spaces. Um, as a young girl, even I, I'm writing my book right now and I tell the story about being there at school and middle school in green and it was at the time when we were all interested in dating and romance and people were coupling up and there was a boy that I really liked and me being me in all the ways I approached him and I said I like you do you want to be my boyfriend and we'd been hanging out and we'd been friends you want to be my boyfriend like you know these other two people are dating we were still kind of exploring what dating even meant and he said to me oh Rachel you're so cool and we have so much fun but I can't date you because you're black and I'm white and that was a moment where I was confused, not only because of the racial aspect of dismissal, but also the fact that I didn't feel like I had anyone else I could talk to that might have had that experience or might have been going through it or even could affirm me in moving towards a different experience. And I think that in situations like that, where, you know, classic teenager problems, um, the, the frustrations and the growing pains of elementary school, so much of the conversation I was in were with book characters, were being able to move through stories that might give me a hint to how I might be able to move through the world when situations come upon my shore. And so books offer what I call possibility models. And books offer us a opportunity to see ourselves reflected on the page, or even if we don't see ourselves reflected, it offers us some framework from which we can build ourselves. And I'm interested to know for people who are here, who are in the comments, I'd love to hear from you if there were any books or any characters who offered you a reflection of yourself that you hadn't had before or that you didn't know you needed. And sometimes it's a negative reflection. Like you see something that's like so uh, concerning or, you know, those the villains in books or the, the antagonists and you think, oh, I need to reevaluate how I show up in the world so I don't show up that way. And books often through its characters, but also in nonfiction books, where we're reading about real life situations that have happened. We give ourselves the chance to, um, to kind of have an understanding of not only how other people exist in the world, but how we exist and how we do or don't want to show up. So most of thinking of, most of my thoughts around this theme of literature as a gateway to understanding is um, seeing, seeing and access, having a reflection, a reflection of self and a reflection of the world, having access to information and having access to um, other world possibilities. But then lastly, it, it, it acts as like a, a safe haven, a, a safer way to explore the world than to be running through it and to be meeting people. And maybe we don't have access to the funds to travel. And maybe we don't have access to go and see one of our favorite people speak in person. Reading books and having this literature available is paramount to our personal growth. And we, we should always want that for the community that we live in. And I think that particularly Akron Public Libraries have been, were my entire childhood, such a huge part of my self-discovery um, and also this, the discovery of other people, like seeing what other people are reading and what they're grappling with and what they're interested in at that time. It really is, literature is such a beautiful way to build communities in, in ways that I don't think we always um, are aware of or are intentional with. I wanted to um, kind of read something for you all. This is from the Toni Morrison book, The Source of Self-Regard. Oh, you can't see it because of my little blurry background. But The Source of Self-Regard, I know it's um, backwards for you all, but this is a selection of essays, speeches, and meditations by Toni Morrison, here she is, that really um, 
have worked into my own approach of living with literature, of being in constant conversation, not only as a writer, but as a reader and as the owner of a bookstore who is hoping to usher this conversation into more and more um, ears and hearts and homes and um, communities. And I wanted to read a passage before um, we glide into the Q&A that I'm hoping um, will help us all to recalibrate around this conversation of literature. And um, I hope, you know, my greatest hope is that after this talk and after ruminating on this a little bit, we all go to our personal libraries, our personal shelves in our homes and really look and engage in our relationship to these books a little bit more. So this passage, um, I'm going to read it really quickly and maybe uh, share a few words and then I'm looking forward to uh, Q&A with you all. Let me take a sip of water. <laughs> this is particularly her, this is in an essay called God's Language and it's particularly about narratives. Narrative is one of the ways in which knowledge is organized. I have always thought it was the most important way to transmit and receive knowledge. I am less certain of that now, but if the fact that the craving for narrative has never lessened is any indication, the hunger for it as a keen is as keen as it was on Mount Sinai or Calvary or in the middle of the fens. Even when novelists abandon or grow tired of it as an outmoded metric form, historians, journalists, and performing artists take up the slack. Still, narrative is not and never has been enough, just as the object drawn on a canvas or a cave wall is never simply mimet mimetic. My compact with the reader is not to reveal an already established reality, literary or historical, that he or she and I agree upon beforehand. I do not want to assume or exercise that kind of authority. I regard that as patronizing, although many people regard it as safe and reassuring. And because my metaphor is Black, the artistic demands of Black culture are such that I cannot patronize, control, or pont pontificate. In the third world cosmology, as I perceive it, reality is not already constituted by my literary predecessors in Western culture. If my work is to confront a reality unlike that received reality of the West, it must centralize and animate information discredited by the West. Discredited not because it's not true or useful or even of some racial value, but because it is information held by discredited people, information dismissed as lore or gossip or magic or sentiment. If my work is faithfully to reflect the aesthetic tradition of African-American culture, it must make conscious use of the characteristics of its art forms and translate them into print. And Tiffany, the group art of nature, its functionality, its improvisational nature, its relationship to audience performance, the critical voice that upholds tradition and communal values, and that also provides occasion for an individual to transcend and or defy group restrictions. And I think, um, actually, I'm gonna read one more paragraph because I think this is a big part of it too. <laughs> Working with those rules, the text, if, is, if it is to take improvisation and audience participation into account, cannot be the authority. It should be the map. It should make way for the reader or audience to participate in the tale. The language, if it is to permit criticism of both rebellion and tradition, must be both indicator and mask, and the tension between the two kinds of language is its release and its power. If my work is to be functional to the group, to the village as it were, that it must bear witness and identify danger as well as possible havens from danger. It must identify that which is useful from the past and that which ought to be discarded. It must make it possible to prepare for the present and live it out. It must do that not by avoiding problems and contradictions, but by examining them. I should not even attempt to solve social problems, but it should certainly try to clarify them. Um, that passage from her essay, God's language, I think, is the most laid out and clear understanding of how language leads to understanding. Um, and I love that in Toni Morrison's work, she didn't offer that she would be the one giving the understanding, that we shouldn't be searching in books for the answers, but that we owe it to ourselves and to our humanity to use literature as an opportunity to grapple with these social problems, to grapple with these issues within ourselves, to grapple with these questions we have with 
with each other in order to land at a space where we can have a more critical, rational conversation. And I hope that as we continue to pour through the work of all of the literary greats, the work of everyone on the shelves at Elizabeth's, um, by the way, the bookshelves at Elizabeth's has no, um, cis het white men on the shelves. We have taken away all of the traditional expected literature that we have learned from for years and we replace it with the voices of queer, black, um, disabled, um, people who don't, who aren't neurotypical and these, um, you know, indigenous people, people who have a voice and who have intention in what they have to say and who are really presenting us with clear and true materials for us to really be critical of how we are approaching the world from our own personal lens and in relationship with each other. I had mentioned earlier that I teach through a framework of KEA, which stands for knowledge, empathy, and action. And I'd love, um, before we head into Q&A, to share with you just what that, that reference is. And I think that um, with knowledge, as we learn how to show up in the world, our knowledge has to be critical. We have to learn from the actual people who we're trying to learn from. I encourage any students here, as you move into your next school year in the fall, to take your syllabi that you get, and I call it scour the syllabi, and go through and look for the to, for perhaps photos or uh, descriptions of the authors of the books that your courses are suggesting. And if you're in a course where all of the authors are white, men are white or they're all men, I encourage you to challenge your teacher and say, why do you feel like this is the only authority that we can learn from? And how do you possibly assume that we can have something critical for learning from the same type of person? Um, uh, so knowledge, this intent on being under, of understanding where we are getting our information from. The next is empathy. And I use uh, a phrase of a radical empathy that when we're exploring conversations or situations, not just asking ourselves or not just being empathetic in a way that we say, I see you, I hear you. Um, I'm sorry for what you're going through, but really questioning ourselves and saying, what is it about how I exist in the world that is directly affecting how you exist in the world? And those are conversations of race, they're conversations of class, they're conversations of ability, that we have to take accountability for the ways that oppressive systems are being held up by people who aren't even consciously participating in them. And how can we disrupt these systems with the privileges that we have um, within them? Then the last is action. And that, you know, particularly thinking about this conversation of language, you know, of literature being a gateway to understanding that if we are going to be true to that, if we're going to actually uh, insist that we believe it, then we have to start taking action in how literature is showing up. You know, is there questions that you need to be asking your child's school or if you don't have a child, your local school district about the literature that's on their shelves? If we need to be more intentional in calling out, um, you know, any particular literature spaces like bookstores, libraries, um, academic spaces and asking them, you know, how are black voices represented and heard and how is your canon not giving the full opportunity for understanding for our students or our community. And I hope that we can move through that knowledge, empathy and action to all continue to do small things to make sure that we have as much inclusivity and as much, you know, it's it's about being dynamic, having this prism of voices and insights and experiences to really continue to seed into this garden we're trying to go to grow for all of our flourishing, whether it's emotional, mental, social, I think there's so much that can be, uh, so much good that can come out, starting with literature and books. Um, Jennifer, I think we could hop into the Q&A if there were any questions. Oh, we can't hear you, Jennifer, you're on mute. Thank you so much, Rachel. You provided so much insight and we have so many wonderful questions that um, the participants in the audience would like to just find out from you. So we'll start off with what is your favorite book ever and ever? right now, whenever? I couldn't possibly choose a favorite book. I love a lot of books, <laughs> but um, what's my favorite book ever? 
I, 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 I honestly, I, maybe I'm like a person with children who's like, I couldn't possibly choose my favorite book, but, uh, I'm, I'm very, some of my favorite books are always novels. They're always novels that I get lost in. They're the books where I, I exist in a completely different world for the week or a few days that I'm reading that book and I'm able to really dig into it. But the thing that comes to mind is that I, when I was uh, studying at Hoban and I did a book report called Devil on My Heels and I think about that book all the time. So there's some books that stay with you and you think about them and you think about the characters, you've built a relationship. Um, so I don't have any favorites, but if you go to the Elizabeth's uh, if you go to the Elizabeth's bookshop page, you can see I have a shelf of all of my personal favorites that are on my personal shelves in my home. So if you wanted to, check, so if whoever asked the question would check those out, it's an option. And since you brought up your bookshop, what are your hours um, in your bookshop? And can you order books not on your shelves? Um, yes, you can. If you go to our bookshop page, you can absolutely order books that aren't on our physical shelves. And the hours, I think they changed recently, but I'm going to go into Instagram and look for y'all to see what the specific hours are. Um, but yes, any book that is available, our online store has access to all of the books that would be on any major shelves. And then if you decide to go in person, you'll be able to see our specialized curated bookshelves from conversations that we've been having or guests that we've asked to curate them but I'm going to get that information before we leave about the time and while you're looking into that information if you could go back to your 10 year old self mm. tell us about one thing going on in the world today uh, well let me read that again if you could go back and tell your 10 year old self about one thing going on in the world today what would it be and what advice would you give to prepare yourself you know, I love this conversation about being in relationship with my younger self. I get asked this question often. And one thing I love about when people ask me this is that oftentimes, if I was able to be in conversation with my younger self, I would want advice from my younger self. I don't even think I have it. I, I don't even think there's any. Thank you, Jules, for posting the hours. I don't think that I would even... I, I would be like, girl, tell me, how do I make friends as an adult? How do I like... Remind me what Akron looks and feels like, you know, like, tell me how to play, show me how to play again, show me what rest looks like. And so I think that when people ask me about my younger self, I'm often much more interested in hearing from my younger self. But, uh, and, and I say, you know, I, I would say my religion is being in conversation, you know, learning from my younger self and praying to my older self and saying like, what do I need to do in order to be my best self for you? What can I learn from these various aspects of my younger self that I lost that are often the most authentic versions of ourselves, uh, you know, when we're younger. But, okay, I'll answer the question. So <laughs> I think that... Um, I think that what I would tell my younger self, I would really prepare her for the celebration of things that are, you know, now as I'm 32, and I think that I don't think younger me, 10 year old me would ever think that this conversation of rest among black people, this idea of like, we are allowed to rest, we must rest, that it's part of our uh, birthright, that, re you know, that participating in capitalism is not what we were born for. And, um, you know, because when we're 10 years old, we're always getting asked, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? What type of work do you want to do? How, how do you want to contribute? You know, how do you want to be productive for? Or the system that we're in. And I think that I would uh, tell my younger self that I hope they remember the feeling in their body of rest and of play so that it will show up again more easily throughout my adulthood. Wow. And I think this one goes um, really well with what you're talking about. What is one thing you appreciated more due to the pandemic? Oh, I appreciate solitude so much more. I appreciate solitude so much more. I knew I valued it, but I like need it these days. <laughs> and I think, you know, I have a lot of conversation about um, my decision to be child free and I am a single woman as well. And so I think that I've been having so many blissful moments of really being able to appreciate the solitude that I have at any given, whether it's like, 
my slow mornings or just like being able to hop in bed at 5 p.m. if that's how tired I am and not really have to think about anything else. It has been so much uh, so much of the glory <laughs> of the last year that I can uh, really rest rest in solitude and in the in the importance of and how real online friendships are you know like sometimes we dismiss them as like oh you haven't met that person in real life but really our online friends who have been watching us and seeing us and being part of our growth have been such a anchor in the last year of getting through the pandemic to know that you're connected even if we aren't able to see each other okay thank you so in ohio there is a push for state legislation to block any diversity, equity, and inclusion teaching in the uh -huh. curriculum. Mm -hmm. Literature is a key way to teaching understanding. What are your thoughts? And in particular, I think it's House Bill 327, you know, which is, you know, putting forth, you know, I, and it's happened, it's happening both nationally and uh -huh. statewide, where there is this huge push around, you know, DEI, critical uh -huh. race theory, and systematic racism being taught in school. So what are your thoughts around that? Can you tell me specifically the question again that you want me to, I, I, heard, I hear your commentary on how it's happening everywhere. Tell me specifically which, what question. So what like. are your, so in Ohio, there's a pushback on, in, on their state legislation to block any yes. DEI teaching in the curriculum, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, I, I mean that my thoughts are that's just white people being white. I mean, I don't that I'm not surprised. I'm not confused. I'm not there. It, it's it's classic behavior of gaslighting. It's classic behavior of narcissism. It's classic behavior. If, if you I always say being a black person in America is being in relationship to whiteness in the same way that you're in relationship with an abusive partner. It's really an abusive partner and abusive. They're constantly gaslighting you. They're constantly telling you your experience is not real. They're constantly suggesting that their truth is the only truth and you now have to assimilate to it. And so I'm not at all surprised by this. And this is, uh, is, is imperative to why this type of literature, the types of bookstores like Elizabeth, the types of conversations like these ones we're having today are imperative because whiteness will never ever, I always say whiteness is either the hero or the victim. It will never exist in a space of accountability if it can help it. And so we're, we're seeing, and, and I, I want to emphasize my language of if it can help it, because as we saw in 2020, whiteness couldn't help it anymore. It had to start caring about, you know, it, companies had to start addressing DEI. That's why DEI got blow, blown up because they couldn't help it anymore. They were losing, basically they were losing money if they weren't adhering to the new push and expectation for racial justice in one way or another. So this pushback is not a surprise to me. And it is a indicator of the type of relationship that racial equity and whiteness has been in since the very beginning. Thank you. So someone said, I enjoy reading to my fifth graders for 15 minutes after lunch, recess each day. What are a few books you recommend for this time of day in the classroom? Fifth graders. Man, I miss being a fifth grader. My, I'm trying to think what my fifth grade teacher might have read to me, you know, there are, especially on Liz, on uh, some of the bookshelves and the link is in the chat, some of the best YA books that might not be easy for a fifth grader to read through, but to be read to them, to follow those stories. Um, Jason Reynolds is winning at life right now with all of his incredible books. He's won many awards. Um, Candace Ilo has put out some really wonderful books, but I really, I, I, re I want to um, insist maybe, or suggest, I should say, uh, to give fifth graders some poetry, to give them some, some things to make, you know, thinking after recess and after lunch, you're so tired and kind of sloggy and maybe some nice light poetry from either other children or um, some of the, you know, Mahogany Brown is a poet who has done a lot of work for children. Um, and so I think maybe some, um, poets of color might be good short snippets of easy reading and conversation starters. So you talked about some children books for some younger folks. So can you offer us some recommendations for maybe some titles that should, uh, that we should read adult learners um, or even high school? You know, what should we be reading like fiction and non, especially any we can buy through your shop? 
Yes, we have, um, if you go to the shop, we have lots of categorized shells that I think um, it would be of interest. But one thing that's coming to mind, particularly for the people of color who are listening and for the people who are looking um, maybe to gift people of color, I think that's so much in literature, particularly thinking about nonfiction, so much of it is rooted in pain. It's so much, you know, a story about police brutality or explaining a racialized experience, maybe going through the history of slavery. And I encourage people to look for and celebrate books that are just about Black people existing in one way or another. Like it doesn't have to be rooted in pain and in trauma, which so much of our experience in America is. But I think we can put more emphasis and celebration. In this boom of DEI, there's been so much trauma and hurt and pain being pushed. And every single book is about um, recovering or surviving whiteness in one way or another. And so I want to suggest um, looking for and reading books that are silly or that have a very um, light storyline to recalibrate ourselves and remember that Black people exist with families and with their puppies and with their job situations and in their beautiful neighborhoods. They're not just on this earth surviving whiteness. Right. So if you could create a new canon, who Ooh. would you include in it? Ooh, like modern people or like yeah. old, like I I'm thinking of like, obviously I'm thinking of Toni Morrison. I'm thinking of Zadie Smith. I'm thinking of Alexandra L. I'm thinking of um, who else? I'm like looking on my bookshelf at all of my books that the people I would want in a canon. And, it, and I, I, I also like to think of people, um, you know, in other countries who are giving other experiences of Blackness, like Blackness doesn't look the same everywhere. Um, being Indigenous doesn't look the same everywhere. Um, having a disability doesn't look the same everywhere. And I think that when we tap into really having uh, showing up for marginalized communities that there's so much fun and possibility in having a wide range of perspectives. And so, uh, you know, Bell Hooks, Alice Walker, Nikki Giovanni, these people who have completely shattered me and put me back together a million times. Um, and a lot of the, the people, um, Morgan Jerkins, her books right now are like blowing my mind. Uh, Jasmine Mann's, her poetry right now is absolutely melting me. There's there's so much goodness out there. So we have a few more, well, maybe two more minutes. So we'll try to get two questions in, minute per question. Okay. So what brought you to the choice of filtering your curated authors by race background? And does this exchange one form of exclusion for another? No, it doesn't. Uh, so <laughs> say the first question again so I can make sure that I address it. What like, brought you to the choice of filtering your curated I did. I didn't bring me to the choice. What brought me to the choice? <laughs> what brought me to the necessity? This wasn't a choice, this is a necessity. And that the idea that highlighting voices that have been traditionally marginalized is a new form of marginalization. That's the type of gaslighting I'm referring to. This outlandish suggestion that a tradition, a, a community. I mean, if we think all the way back to enslavement, that our languages were lost, that we were separated by the inability to communicate, that that core value of communication was stripped from us. And for, for me or anyone else to come in and say, no, I'm no longer going to be erased. And for that to be twisted into now it's another form of discrimination is a is a lack of critical thinking about all of the histories and everything that would bring us to this moment, but also the, the odd intent, the, the odd suggestion that um, I'm doing it with the same intent, that I'm doing it with the same motive. The motive of me being dismissed, of Black voices being dismissed over history was silencing, was enslavement. Me, I'm doing it to celebrate. I'm doing it to give voice to. And so if, if someone might feel that my approach is exclusionary, that is because you're assuming that my censoring of this community is acting in the same way that whiteness acts and it's not. Thank you. 
So outside of home, where's your favorite? This is the last question. Yes. Outside of home, where's your favorite place to travel to? And where can you, where you can enjoy solitude? So where's your favorite place to travel where you can enjoy solitude? My two favorite places that come to mind, I love being in um, Accra, Ghana in West Africa. I could be there all day, every day. It's one of my favorite places. And then I also, uh, Japan is just absolutely gorgeous and a wonderful place for grounding and reflection. Thank you so much for your time. Rachel, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing truly such a powerful message. On behalf of the Akron Roundtable, it's my pleasure to send to you a Don Drum Sun as a thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. And um, this work of art was designed, as you know, exclusively for the Roundtable by Akron artist Don Drum. Again, we can't thank you enough. Um, and thank all of you for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again at our next virtual forum on July 15th, when we will host Regina Cooper Benjamin, Deputy Director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Her topic, Digital Inclusion 101. Thanks again and have a wonderful day.